So let us begin. I wanted to focus on Daf Yud today, the Daf from Shabbos. I'm not sure if everyone got a chance to do it. Okay, the Gemara up to this point uh, has been like all around, everywhere, uh, various topics. On page nine, on page test, was the topic of the of the dis, of the dispute between the um, the bride and the groom whether she was a virgin or not. So the Gemara has had had a discussion. What or whether the bot, whether the husband is believed and to what extent is the husband believed? Um, meaning, is he believed that he doesn't, he's not allowed to live with her anymore, which everyone agrees to because he is Shavya Nafshe, which means that he creates a new item on the list that is forbidden to him, or can he actually withhold her ksuva money, okay? So that's a, that's a machlokes. And the Gemara on Daf Yud on, on the top uh, continues that discussion regarding the ksuva itself, meaning we've been talking the whole time whether or not the woman is entitled to her ksuva, right, if the husband has a claim against her. So now the Gemara gets into this discussion as to whether a ksuva is the oraisa or the rabbanon, meaning is it a biblical uh, requisite that she gets her ksuva money and that this contract works on a Doraisa level? Or is it just another one of the many, many takanas that the Chachamim gave to the woman? Okay, so let's see what the Gemara has to say. And for some, this may be Chazara, but it's still uh, important. So itmar on the top line, Amr of Nachon, Amr Shmuel, Mishum Rab Shum Ben Elazar. So the Gemara says like this. Okay, Rav Nachman says that Chachamim tiknu lahem levnos Yisrael. The Chachamim were misakin. They were, they instituted this concept for Jewish girls, for a besula, for a virgin matayim, 200 zuz, ula almana mana. And for an almana, excuse me one second, And for a widow, she gets 100. Okay, so this is old news, right? We know this already. But the reason why the Gemara is bringing this down is for the next line. Because the next line says, um, and they believed him, i.e. the husband, if the husband were to claim that she is not a virgin, he is believed. So what is the connection between this takana, that the woman gets 200, and the fact that we believe the husband? Well, Rashi explains, and he says, that we're about to enter a dispute whether this concept, like I said, is it the Orisa or the Rabbanan? Is it a rabbinic uh, institution, or is it foundation found in the Torah? So Rashi explains that if you claim that this ksuva is, is based from the Torah, then how in the world could the husband just say, well, based on my opinion, I don't think she's a virgin. After all, the, the, the Torah grants her this money, and this money is hers, and the only way to withhold it it's not by the husband making a claim that he thinks that she's not a virgin, because he could be wrong. The only way for him to withhold that money from her is if he has two kosher witnesses that prove somehow that she's not a virgin. Anything short of that, she should be entitled to her money. So Rashi, con Rashi concludes, or based on the Gemara, that it must be that really... This is what they called a hem amru vehem amru, which is basically a two-way takana. It's good for the Baal and it's good for him. Meaning, 
The Chachamim, in fact, said, yes, you are entitled to 200 Zeus, right? But they also, on the other side of the coin, instituted that if the husband has a claim, to assert himself on her and that they can't stay married anymore, but also he's entitled to not pay her her 200 zuz for the ksuva. Okay, so it seems from here, from the words of the Gemara, that they use the word takana, that this is in fact a durabanan. Okay, so that's how the Gemara starts off their conversation. But the Gemara asks the obvious question, im kein maho ilu chachamim betakantam. If that's true, that he could just, at the snap of a finger, say, I don't think you're a virgin and I'm not giving you your money, then what good was the ksuva? Meaning, like, if you want to look at it this way, it's the hey mamru, hey mamru. It's one against one. Meaning, he has a claim, but she has money that's due to her. So why exactly do we believe him over her? He doesn't have, like we said, witnesses. He has a hunch. But she's got, right, she's got money due her. So since when does his hunch trump her money that's due to her? That's what the Gemara wants to figure out. And the conclusion of the Gemara is he has a very, very powerful uh, bullet, okay, in his gun. And that is... Okay, the, the Gemara has a very, very uh, excellent insight as to how people think and act, right? The word chazaka, in this case over here, means that it's a strong enough um, suspicion that the husband is usually right if he were to make this claim, because if the assumption is that he's paying for the party and the caterer and the hotel and the flowers and the orchestra and the shaitel and everything else that goes with it, right, as was customary for the man to do at that point, then why would he make up such a lie and the next morning go to Besden after he just had a very, very expensive wedding, make up a lie and say she's not a virgin. This flies in the face of, you know, the way reasonable, for the most part, sane people would act. Meaning, if he really disliked her, then he wouldn't have married her. He wouldn't have made up this phony story how she's not a virgin and waste all the money that he spent on the wedding. So that seems like a very, very good, like I said, this is a very good uh, bullet in his gun that he uses enough, right? So that's why the Gemara says he's believed in this case, because through this, he's actually believed. This is a chazaka, okay? And the Ritva explains very, very, uh, very succinctly that what's going on over here Um, do I have it over here? No, but but basically the Ridva says is that he has a chazaka, right? He has a chazaka and she has a chazaka. She has what we call cheskas mamon, meaning she has money at her side, okay? Now, she wants to pull money out of him, right? So the problem is whenever you want to pull money out, you have to prove it right? He has a chazaka on her, basically, right? He has a chazaka going the other way. So we need something to counteract this chazaka that the woman has. So this chazaka that a person wouldn't waste his money on a wedding is so strong that it overrides her chazaka of being a basula, right? Meaning we don't know whether she was a basula or not, but she's a chazaka, that she's a basula until proven otherwise. So therefore, this chazaka acts as, a, as the tipping point 
to say that, okay, this is going to put the case in his favor that if she wants to collect her money, right, she's going to have to prove it somehow. But up until then, he's in the, he's in the, right, he's in the, So I mentioned before that the assumption is, is that the man pays for the wedding or else his chazaka doesn't make sense. So the answer is most people say, yeah, that's how it was done then. The man pays for the wedding. So today the question is, would this apply, right? Because today, um, I'm not sure how it works, but uh, depending on the situation, right? Right? Yes. Everybody today is considered mukasets because nobody gets married at 12 anymore. So everybody's really like a mukasets. Why are you talking about mukasets? You know I'm saying like, so you can never have a claim of a basua because you don't. Okay, she right. Can. Right. So therefore, the question of a chazaka wouldn't really apply over here. But the Rashba, I saw, brings a very interesting point. The Rashba says, what if he didn't pay for the wedding? What if his grandparents paid? And it's no skin off his back that they just spend $200,000 on a wedding. So then, according to the Rashba, he would say that then it doesn't apply because there's no chazaka. It only applies when what? When the person spent money on the wedding. Then he's going to say to himself, there is no way I'm, I'm going to make up a story and waste all that money. That is completely inconceivable. That doesn't make any sense. But if he's not paying for it, right? then there's no chazaka. And therefore, the Rashba concludes that the chazaka of the woman, right, it's called cheskas haguf, overrides the cheskas hamamon, right? Meaning, even if both are 100%, the, the man says, I'm 100% sure that you're not a basula. And she says, and we've had this gemara in the last three or four days, if you've been doing the daf on your gimel, your dalit, all this contention between back and forth, I am a basula, I'm not a basula, right? The husband proves it or attempts to prove it. What if he's for sure and the woman, and the woman isn't sure? So the Rashba has an insight over here that says that if he doesn't pay for the wedding, then all bets are off. We don't favor his side. Why? Because the chazaka of the woman being a virgin trumps the cheskas mamon, that the money is in the chassan's pocket now, and she wants to take it out. And she's bari, she's 100% sure, and he's 100% sure. So the answer is we go after the fact, the chazaka, that a majority of the women who get married are virgins. And that chazaka would trump the cheskas mamon of having the 200 zuz in the chassan's pocket. Okay? And He's holding on to it, all right? So therefore, it's very important that, I'm not saying the moral of the story is to pay for your own wedding. I'm just saying that, you know, if you were to ask that question, right, there, the, the Rashba has an answer because we all assume that, sure, the, the, the boy's side pays for the whole wedding. So that's the way it used to be, but um, that's just a side point by the Rashba. All right, I saw... Uh, the, the, the Rambam actually has an interesting line over here, if I could find it. Um, I don't know what I, uh, the, so the, when, when the Rambam quotes this, he says that Chazaka, that what? He, he quotes a Gemara, he says, Chazaka, and he says, and it's going to turn from a happy occasion to a, to an avelus, to a sad occasion, right? Meaning the Rambam actually adds to this line. He says that, A, you don't want to spend money, and you don't want to turn the wedding day, the supposedly happiest day of your life, to one of dread, right? So that's, the, that's actually the words of the Rambam. Um, anyways, so I wanted to continue, but I thought that was very important regarding how we... Um, how we view this. So the Gemara goes on to say, um, um, if you skip a little bit, uh, the Gemara says, um, so, the, so the Gemara, and 
in, in a few lines says, now, because this is a takana, midurabanan, right now, up, up, up until this point, we're still holding that this is, that, that this ksuva is midurabanan. The Gemara says that all of the takana sulotik be eliminaziburis. And because it's only a rabbinic level, the rules of payment is that if you were to pay her with real estate, for example, let's say if you didn't have enough cash. Now we're actually going to discuss what 200 zuz is in a minute or in a few minutes. But let's say he didn't have the cash. He only had apartment buildings, right? He had real estate. So the way it works is that when you have when you owe someone money, you could either pay him. There's three classes of real estate. It's called Idis, Bainanis, and Ziburis. Class A, Class B, and Class C. Right? When it comes to paying the woman, because it's a Durabanan level, you are allowed to pay her the 200 Zuz equivalent with real estate, but bad real estate. Right? Meaning you had properties, let's say, um, in Miami, right? The best properties, right? Then you had properties in New Jersey, middle tier properties. Then you had properties on the wrong side of the tracks in DC. Now he had a lot of them, right? So he had, so 10 DC properties equals one Miami property, let's say. So does he have to give her the one Miami or can he give her 10 of the DC properties? So that's what the Gemara over here says, is that because this is only on a, on a rabbinic level, he could get away with giving her the DC properties, okay? So that's all if you're under the assumption that a ksuva is a midrabanan. Rav Shun ben Gamliel, Omer ksuva is isha min ha-Torah. Rav Shun ben Gamliel says no. He argues that, and says that it's only, that it's actually a do'oraisa, it's from the Torah. So the Gemara asks a good question. Says, We're about the 15th line or so from the top. Okay, the, we're about to quote a Pasuk now. Uh, let me open it up. It's a Pasuk in Mishpatim. And the, um, the Pasuk is talking about what we call a Mefateh. Okay, there's rape. Okay, and then there is what we call seducing. So the Pasuk in Mishpatim in chapter 22 says, let me read it. It's right after the Shomrim. It says, ish besula right? If a man seduces a woman who's a virgin, right? Who's not, um, no, she, she's not married. So it says, Mahoria maharena lola isha. Okay, he must make her his wife with a payment. Okay, meaning lechatchila, the Torah says, believe it or not, and the same is true to rape. The lechatchila, if you punish, if you seduce a woman, your punishment, quote unquote, is that is that you should marry her. Okay, and what if, assuming the father, assuming her father agrees, what if her father doesn't agree? If her father refuses, then it says, So he still has to pay a penalty, and the penalty is what the price is. What's the price of a bride who's a virgin? So we know what the price is, because later on in the Torah, in Pashas Kitetze, when the Torah talks about rape, it says that you have to pay 50 shekel, you have to pay 50 silver pieces. That's the penalty. There's also embarrassment and there's pagam, and we're actually going to discuss this in about a month from now in the fourth perek of, of Ksuvas. But right now, what's important to know is that the source, believe it or not, of the Ksuva being from the Torah is from the seduction slash rape um, discussion, which says that the fine happens to be the same fine of the dowry of the girl who's about to get married, which is 50. And 50 silver pieces equals 
Matayim Zuz equals 200 Zuz. Because the Zuz, after all, is silver based, as we're going to see in a few minutes. Okay, so the Gemara says, brings this Pasuk, and the Pasuk says, Kesef Yishkal Kamor Habesulo, she has that Kamor Habesulo, Smor Habesulo, Kazet. that it's a da'oraisa concept. And Rav Shuman Gamliel Omer Ksuve Isha Enim Elam Medivrei Torah Elam Medivrei Sofrin. So then Rav Shuman Gamliel says it's a da'rabanan, which is a kasha on Rav Shuman Gamliel a minute ago, who said it's mina midoraisa, and the Gemara has an answer that we flip. So anyways, the point is, is that we go, go back and forth. The Gemara brings another proof that it's from the Torah, because there's a Mishnah later on at the end of the Mesechta that talks about which currency you pay a woman if you divorce her in a land where you didn't marry her, like if you married her in Israel and you moved away to, to Greece, let's say. Do you pay her in, in, in Israel money or in Greek money or in different kinds of monies? And the Gemara has a proof from there that it's also a Doraisa concept. So the question is, let's talk practically now, 2022. So how do we hold? We saw different sides in the Gemara that one opinion says it's on a Doraisa level, one says it's in a, in a Durabana level. So before we look at, um, before we look at the um, Tosfus and the commentators on the Gemara, okay, let's look at the Chumash, okay, because the Chumash is going to answer the question, how we hold. All right, so let's look at uh, Rashi. Rashi says in Parshish Mishpat, you know, sometimes you want to go in the Shulchan Arach and the Rishonim, as I've been saying for the last year, the very first step is to look at the Pasuk and see what the commentators in the Chumash say about the Pasuk. So Rashi says, Yifsok la mohar ke mishpat ish ishto. When it says in, by when you seduce her that your penalty is that you have to is that you have to give her the price of marriage, so Rashi says you give her the the amount that a conventional man would give to his wife, meaning he shall write her a ksuva, right? Shakosov la ksuva visa ena, right? That he writes a ksuva and he marries her. It sounds like from Rashi that this concept of ksuva is from the Torah. It's very hard to debate that. Meaning that that's why the Torah says that whatever you should you would normally pay your wife as a ksuva price, you would give her as a penalty if you seduce her, right? So same, that's the same, that's the same amount. But Rashi is very clear that you would, that it's an Araisa level. Look at the words of the Ramban. Very interesting words the Ramban use. He says, Uperish Mahoryu Maharena Lola Isha. The explanation of Mahoryu Maharena, which means that he'll give her the marriage price, says the Ramban, Sheyishlach la Savlonus, the Tsarche Chupal Hiyos Lola Isha. Has nothing to do with the word Ksuva. Ksuva is completely not mentioned in the world in the eyes of the Ramban. You know what he's paying her? He's giving her money. He's giving her money so that she could register a bed, bath, and beyond. Nothing to do with ksuva, nothing to do with anything about a marriage document. He gets her literally savlanus, which are like gifts, right? And things needed for the chuppah in order to make her his wife, right? She has to have expenses. She gets her hair done. She gets this, she gets that. Whatever it is, it has nothing to do with the ksuva. So before we get into the Rishonim and Achronim and all the back and forth, very, very clear machlokas between the Rashi and the Ramban. Forget about later on, just right off the bat, looking at the Chumash, it sounds like a very easy machlokas, Rashi Ramban, whether it's actually a Doraisa, like Rashi says, or a Dorabana. So I thought that was very interesting. Now let's look at the top Tosfus on Yud Amad Aleph. Okay, the top Tosfus says, well, he goes back and forth, and 
the truth is the Gemara times switches is it a deraisa or a derabanan? So if you look in the fourth line in Tosfus, it starts with Amar of Nachman. It's the fourth wide line. Second word, Alma Stama de Hasha Saber de Ksuba de Rabbanon. Have a hunch. He's going to need a whole lot more than a hunch. He's going to need two kosher witnesses. So it sounds from the Gemara that it's a that it's a Durabanon. So Tosfus asks a very good question. Vakasha. Right? So if you ever listen to the rabbi up there reading out the ksuva, okay, I know it's hard to hear, it's hard to understand it, it's in Aramaic, right? We may not be paying attention, but the words he uses are very, very distinctly clear. I'll read it again. He uses the words, kesef zuze matan, which means 200 zuz, that is fitting to you on a Torah level. <laughs> I mean, that is pretty clear that it's a Do'oraisa. So, Gemara, so Tosa says, well, which one is it? From the Gemara, it sounds like a Durabanon, but if you actually read the Ksuva, it sounds like a Do'oraisa. Okay, so Rabbeinu Tam says that we rely on a different Gemara. Rabbeinu Tam says, yes, you will have a Gemara that says it's a Durabanon, but Rabbeinu Tam relies on the Gemara at the end of the Masechta, which I mentioned in passing before, regarding the, the kind of currency that he gives her. And the Mishnah seems to sound like because he gives her the currency of where the marriage took place, not where the divorce took place, right? Remember, he got married in Israel, he divorced her in Greece, or vice versa. So because Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says that you give her the money based on the currency of where the deal was signed, right? It's like a closing. A marriage is a kind of a closing, like a real estate closing. So you go where the closing occurred. So if the closing of the marriage was in Israel, then you use that. It doesn't matter where the divorce happened and vice versa, right? So therefore, Tosa says, because we always hold like Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, Therefore, he's switching his opinion, according to Rabbeinu Tam, that it is, in fact, is a Do'oraisa. Okay, so that's, so that's one way to look at it. So the Tosfus, you know, sounds like now it's a Do'oraisa, okay, uh, based on the Rabbeinu Tam. The Rush and the Ritva do not, agree, do not agree. So if you look at the Rush in the back, I have it over here. Um, I just want to read the words. Um, find it. So the rush says over here, the tema. So he basically, in, expl in explaining it, he has the same problem that Tosfus had about the fact that we write kesef zuze matan dechazi lechimi do'oraisa. Okay, so he asked that question, but then he says, well, the Rabbeinu Tam says that, in fact, it is a Do'oraisa. Okay, um, and if you look later on in the Rosh, he says, He says, I could answer that question very well, because what's the Ksuva saying? It's saying that the 200 Zuz is being set aside for you, the money is the oraisa. So what does that mean? Does that mean that the ksuva is the oraisa or the money is the oraisa? So with the rush over here, what he does very well is he splits hairs. He says, the chachamim tiknu chamishim kesef mi the oraisa. Yes, the 50 silver pieces are on a deraisa level, perish mishkolam ha'amurim betorah. Ah, these are 50 Do'oraisa coins. What does that mean? Well, if we've seen various Gemaras through Shas, we would know that there's a Do'oraisa coin and there's a Durabanan coin. It's called Mana Tzuri or Mana Medina. There's different levels of coins. And we're gonna see in a minute 
that the Oraisa coin was worth eight times more than the Rabbanon coin. So that's what the Oraisa is referring to, says the Rush. It's not referring to the concept of Ksuva, it's referring to the currency, that these are 50 silver pieces that are meant Again, why? Why are these coins worth so much more? Why are they worth eight times more? Why don't we go cheap? We're going to see that the Sephardim actually go cheap. The Sephardim do an eighth. The, the, the 200 Zuz in Sephardim is, a, is, 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 a 80, uh, is, is seven eighths less than our than, than, than our money. I'll show you that in a second. Um, anyways, so that's so that's the way the rush explains it. Um, now, the Rambam, if we mention now, getting back to the class last week, I think it was last week, whether the marriage is the Raisa or Midra Banan, the Rambam says it's Midra Oraisa. And if you remember the words of the Rambam that he says in um, I'm just going to pull it up over here that he says in um, the very, very beginning of Hilchas Ishos, right? He says uh, the very first law in the laws of marriages, he says, what's the mitzvah? V'lekuchem elu mitzvahs ase shel Torah. Um... And he says, one of the things you have to do is you have to be Makadish her. And then it says, he puts in the word Ksuva, with a Ksuva. So the Rambam is actually, sounds like he's more in the Doraisa camp. Now, I'm finally going to get to it. What? So how much is 200 Zuz? So if you just read, like if you just hear the Ksuva, Right, you wouldn't really think that 200 zuz. It doesn't sound like a lot of money, and in fact, there's a whole discussion. There was even a case in in the Supreme Court in Israel a few years ago where the guy wrote uh, something in the ksuva and, the, and they got divorced, and the woman claimed that she wanted all this money, and um, you know, so they had to basically explain how much money really 200 zuz is. So. As I mentioned before, that there's a biblical zuz and a rabbinic zuz. So there is actually a machlokis in the poskim, right? What the zuz is? Is it a what we call kesef tzuri, which is a deoraisa zuz, or is it kesef medina, which is a rabbinic? Now, obviously, now as I mentioned before, that the that the biblical zuz is worth eight times more because it's all silver. The rabbinic zuz is an eighth silver and seven eighths copper. Now, silver is worth obviously a whole lot more than copper, even in today's crazy world. Um, so the Sephardim, okay, follow the fact that it's rabbinic, which means their zuz, that means that our 200 zuz is eight times more in Ashkenazim than the Sephardic. Okay. And we got this from the Ramah. Um, so if you calculate, okay, a zuz is 4.8 grams of silver. Yes, that's, well, um, that's what the court said in Israel, by the way, that 200, well, I'll get to the punchline now, is that 200 zuz was an estimate of what uh, alimony would be for a year of support. So that's how much we give her. New York State, other, you know, gives, uh, gives a woman 10 years. <laughs> the Gemara only gives her one year. So anyway, that's one definition that the that the court actually used in Israel. And it came out to be about $75,000. Uh, but again, it all depends on the woman and where. And there's a, you could imagine how contentious a case like that could be, right? Because everybody thinks that they deserve more than they do, right? So how do you ever agree on anything, right? Hence, you know, divorce lawyers. But anyways... Just getting back to the numbers is just so you should know that the zuz 
for Ashkenazim is 4.8 grams of silver. So multiply that by, so 200 zuz is 961 and a half grams of silver. So there. Therefore, based on the current price of silver, which is even another discussion, do you go by what silver trades at on the on the NYMEX or whatever? Let's say on um, you know the price of silver, right? Uh, is is somewhere in the mid twenties or fifty seven cents a gram? So a single zuz is two dollars and seventy five cents. So two hundred zuz at nine hundred sixty one grams of silver is only five hundred fifty dollars, right? Um, and you could imagine dividing that by eight for Svardim, right? So if you're a if if you're an Ashkenaz boy who marries a Sephardi girl. Okay, I don't know why anyone would ever do that. Um, then you have, then the girl actually gets an eighth. So her ksuva at the end of the day is worth $34. That's how much she gets in a divorce. I will keep all opinions to myself and all, um, uh, you know, as I always do. But other opinions, like we just mentioned, uh, the Gemara doesn't actually talk about it. Postkim say that it is really the, you know, one year's worth of living. Um, so we don't really go as, you know, give her $34 in case of a divorce. I don't even think that covers the parking at the divorce lawyer's office. So therefore, it's obviously not a real number, but we have to have something. And, uh, you know, just to educate everyone, and the next time we're at a wedding and we hear all these words, hopefully we remember a little bit about the various um, about the various topics. I wanted to jump uh, to Ahmed Bey's. I wanted to pick up on a Gemara that was that probably went by without any, you know, any uh, any real discussion. You know, sometimes it's those Gemaras that people just skip not skip, but just read fast and don't talk about that have a lot of interest to me, at least. As you know by now, I'm, I'm into, you know, these obscure references and other uh, esoterica. So I wanted to pick up something that I saw on Amud Bey's that's interesting. The Gemara wants to know the etymology of the word almana. So if you go to Yod Amud Bey's, the one, two, three, four, the fourth wide line, we mentioned in the Mishnah that a Basula gets 200 and Almana, a widow, gets 100. Great. So the Gemara wants to know, what does the word Almana come from? Right? Sometimes the Gemara likes to, you know, discuss things like that. So the Gemara says, Amar Ravchana Bagdasa, so Ravchana from Baghdad says, Almana al Shemana. The Almana gets, why is an Almana called an Almana? Because inside the word Almana, you have Al, and then you have Mana. Right? Mana means a hundred. So therefore, that's where the word almana comes from. It's like reverse, right? So that's where it comes from. Very interesting. So I saw actually in the back, we've quoted him a few times for the Rashash. The Rashash is a, is a Achron uh, who has very, very sharp uh, points. And he says over here, okay, that's the word mana. But what does the word al mean? So you ready for this one? Shmuel, I don't think you heard this. You did? The al is Arabic from the word al. Like al Jazeera means the island. The word the, T-H-E in Arabic is al. So this is the 100. So the, so the Rashash is of the opinion that this is, and don't be surprised because the Torah does use, we've had several Gemaras where it, where the Torah has foreign languages in it, right? We have African, according to Rabbi Akiva in the beginning of Sanhedrin about the word totafot. We have Aramaic, Yigar Sahaduta, right? So here we have Arabic. I just wanted to throw that out there uh, for all of you philatelists out there. Um, no, that's a stamp collector. Linguists, sorry about that. Um, Almanamina Eris and Michael Lamemar. 
So the Gemara asks, great, I understand that what that Almana, right? But Almana from an Arison who gets 200, meaning if she's an Almana, but she never, but she's still a Basula. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because she got engaged, but never finalized it. And the husband, unfortunately, died. uses the word almana many times. He uses it in Amor, it uses it in, it, I think the first time it's, I think it's in Vayeshev by the store of Yehuda and Tamar that we come back to again for the fifth time, right? Anyways, the word almana is used a lot, but the problem is there was no 100 yet for the almana in the times of the Torah. So how could you tell me that the Torah is ref making reference to something that didn't exist yet? Very good question, right? So the Gemara says, Da'atidin Rabbanan de Metakne Lamana. Ah, the Rabbanan had future glasses on, right? I'm sorry, the, meaning the Torah knew that one day it was going they were gonna get a mana, a hundred. So that's why they're called an Amana. They had future knowledge, they had insider information. Says the Gemara, great question. Umi kasav krala asid? Are you going to tell me, the Gemara asked, that the Torah does that? Where else do we find an example where the Torah references something that at the point when it took place didn't exist yet? How is that possible? Right? This is like back to the future again. So the Gemara says, in, yes. Right, we all know in the beginning of Gracious, it talks about that Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, there were four rivers, right? Pishon, Gishon, Prat, and Chidekel. Right, we know what Chidekel is, and we know what Prat is. Prat is the Euphrates, Chidekel is Tigris, because Chidekel in Aramaic is Diglat. And Diglat, when you rearrange the letters, is Tigris, believe it or not. I didn't make that up. I actually saw it. So it's the Tigris and Euphrates are mentioned. Pishon, Gishon, we don't know what it is. Either way, when it references the river of Chidekel, it says it goes to the east of Ashur. What do you mean Ashur? When Gan Eden was, was up and running, right, in the year one, was there an Ashur yet? Ashur is Assyria. So <laughs> there was no Assyria. It was nothing, right? No one owned any real estate. Vitana, Rabbi Yosef, Ashur, Zeslika. The word Ashur is the city of Selika, which is became the, the Assyrian Empire, whatever it is. It was a major city in the, in the region of Ashur, right? So the Gemara says, Umi have. It wasn't around yet. Eladatida, no, no, no. Eventually, the river was going to be, or the river was at the later date where Assyria was going to be. Hachinami datida. So too over here by the Almana, it's not such a far fetch to say that really the, the Torah at the time didn't have a hundred, but it knew at a later date, it prophesied, right? It had its glasses on, its future glasses, that it was going to be 100. So you could go on and, you know, learn the rest of the daf. But there, this, was, this was very interesting to me because when was Ashur, so let's focus on Ashur for a minute, okay? So Ashur comes into play in the Parsha of Noach. So let's open up Noach, okay? Noach chapter 10. How does chapter 10 start in, in, in Genesis? If anybody knows that, I'll be very surprised. Genesis 10. The Eila told us, B'nei Noach, Shem Cham V'yafes, V'yavodu lahem banim achar ha-mabul. So basically, chapter 10 in Noach is after the Mabul and before Migdal Bavel, right? Before all hell breaks loose and everybody is scattered and punished and bad things.
and before this Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Bavel emanates. So the Torah goes through all of the names, right? We have Shem, we have Cham, and we have Yafes. So the Torah goes through the sons of Yafes, right? Uh, and then sons of Cham. Cham's sons were Kush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. And then we go to the grandkids, right? And then who was the grandkid of Cham? Right? The grandkid of Cham was Nimrod. It says, Vakush Yaladis Nimrod, who as Gibor Ba'aretz. Good. And we all know that Nimrod was a Gibor Tsayid. Pasuk 10, where Nimrod's uh, kingdom, it was where? It was Bavel and Erech and Akkad and Kalelna in the land of Shinar. Right, Shinar was basically the valley where the Migdal was going to be built. Here it is, Cha uh, uh, verse 11. Min ha'aretz hahi yatsa Ashur. Here it is, the first time Ashur is mentioned after the Gan Eden. I'm going to read it, I'm going to translate it because it's a very difficult translation. This is something that you could look at all your life and never realize that the Pasuk is very ambiguous. Min ha'aretz hahi yatsa Ashur. I'll read it in English. From that land, Ashur went forth and built Ninveh, Rehovot, and Kala. So the question is, we're using a pronoun over here. Again, from the land, I'm sorry, from that land, Ashur went forth. What does that mean in English? From that land, Ashur went forth. So was Ashur the land or was Ashur the person? Now, it's interesting to note that Ashur wasn't mentioned yet because you know who Ashur was? Ashur was the son of shame who wasn't introduced yet. Shame comes in, right? We just did verse 11. Shame is mentioned in verse 21, right? Ten psukim later, it says, by the way, Ula Shem Yulad Gamu, Shem also had children. Remember, Shem was the good one, right? Shem and Yafis were the good one, Cham was the bad one. It says, Ula Shem Yulad Gamu, Avi Kol Bnei Ever, Achi Yefes Agadol, Bnei Shem, who are the sons of Shem? Elam, Ashur, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. Okay, those are the five sons of Shem. So believe it or not, I'm not making this up, there's a machlokes in how to read that pasuk. Pasuk 11, where it said what? Where it said, right? Where it said, um, um, where it said, um, I'm sorry. Uh, it said, Mina Aretzahi Yatsa Ashur, right? What does that mean? From that land, Ashur went forth. So let's learn Rashi, okay? Very simple. Rashi says, Kiven Shara Asher as Banov, Shomin le Nimrod, right? As soon as Asher saw that his sons listened to Nimrod, right? Umordin Bemakom, Livnos Amigdal Yatsa Mitocham. As soon as Asher saw that his sons listened to Nimrod rebelling against Hashem by building this Migdal Bavel, he went forth, he, he left, right? He skedaddled, he couldn't take it. He didn't want to be associated with wicked people. Ah, so this sounds like what? This sounds like this Ashur is referring to, right, um, the son of shame, who, by the way, isn't introduced yet. So that's the way Rashi learned. Says the Ramban, Min ha'aretz hahi, he says, from that land, b'malko aleha, out of that land when Nimrod reigned over it, yatza Ashur, Went forth Usher. Pitrono, this means Yatsa el Ashur, meaning he went forth to Usher. <laughs> so Nimrod went to the land of Usher, not Usher left the land of Nimrod. Very interesting. Rashi and the Ramban take this one Pasuk and they learn it completely different, right? This is very rare 
right? I mentioned this a few weeks ago with the Rosh Bam, where they learn Mechiris Yosef differently. This is like another example of something you would never in a thousand years pick up, right? If you don't have to prepare for a class, right? When you look into it and you see that they're arguing on what the Pasuk means. Again, the Ramban says that when Nimrod reigned, He went to the land of Ashur, who created this land, and that's where Nimrod went to. So I found that fascinating. And what's even more fascinating is the following Radak. Okay, let's look at the Radak. The Radak says, I'll, I'll read it in English to save uh, some time. Mina Aretzahi, from the land of Ashur, he went forth in the direction of Assyria. The Torah fails to tell us if Asher belonged to the descendants of Ham or of Shem, meaning, as I said before, Shem's sons are introduced in verse 21, and this is Pasuk 11 when Asher didn't exist yet, right? So it's like out of order. So therefore, you would think that Asher is one of the sons of Ham because Ham's sons were just introduced. So that's why the Radak says it's very mysterious. He says in verse 22, we are told that Elim and Usher were the sons of shame, so that it is unlikely that here we speak of the descendants of shame, the subject matter being the descendants of Ham. However, seeing the Torah did not mention another Ashur, there's no, sometimes we say, oh, there must be two of them, like a coincidence, right? Like there's three Chanochs in Sefer, actually four. There are four Chanochs in Sefer Bracious. We're not going to talk about that now, but sometimes names are used a lot. All right. So the Radak says, seeing the Torah did not mention another Ashur, it is most probable that he was a descendant of Shem. Perhaps he made his home for a while in the land of Shinar, right? The region populated by the descendants of Ham, where Nimrod came from, so that the words Min Haaretz Hahi Yatsa Ashur gain added significance, seeing that this was the first example of someone migrating from one region to another which is also very interesting. I don't know if there's any biblical uh, historians over here, but according to the Radak, someone actually left. I mean, Cain doesn't count because he was kind of kicked out and had to, you know, go on different, you know, and, 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 and wander for the rest of his life. But according to uh, the Radak, now the Radak, by the way, lived in the late 1100s in France. He was born in 1160. So just to give you a context of the knowledge and, you know, the Radak is very famous. He's very into diktuk and grammar and various other things. And sometimes he goes on and talks about, you know, obscure things that seemingly don't mean something. But I think this is very interesting. So again, so he says the words, Mina Aretahi Yatsa Ashur, gain added significance, seeing that this was the first example of someone migrating from one region to another. Perhaps Ashur had even overcome Nimrod or his successor in the land of Shinar and founded a rival kingdom in Nineveh. His kingdom, as distinct from its capital, may have been named after its founder, Ashur. Ashur. We definitely have evidence that the king of Ashur ruled over Babylon and its surrounding region. The various descendants of Ham were expelled from that entire region, being supplanted by the Chaldeans, the Kastim, in the time of Avraham. These people were descendant from shame. Okay, very good. So what's the point over here, right? This is ancient history, like literally. Sometimes you say things that don't matter are ancient history. This is real ancient history. So why are we banging our heads over this? Why am I talking about it? So here's the punchline of the Radak. He says this whole story is only meant to remind us that the entire universe belongs to God. Ah. So what are we arguing about? Who cares whether Rashi's right and it was a son of, of shame and he left or the Ramban that it's referring to Nimrod went to the land of Ashur. Who cares, right? We always ask that question at the end of the class. Who really cares about this trivial, you know, ancient history? So here's what the Radak says, and this is the take home. He says, this whole story is only meant to remind us that the entire universe belongs to God no matter how great the conquerors on earth are. And if he decides to take away a country from its ruler and to substitute new inhabitants and rulers, he will do so at his will. 
Now he quotes a pasuk from Yirmiyahu, who says the exact same thing. The pasuk is in Yirmiyahu 27, Chavzayin, which is the, the beginning of Yirmiyahu. Chavzayin talks about the kingdom of Yehoyakum ben Yoshiyahu, who was the king of Yehuda. And Yirmiyahu prophesied. And basically, Yirmiyahu, three years before this happens, actually prophesizes about it. He says to, uh, he says, that this, is, this is the word of the Yirmiyahu, uh, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. He says, thus said the Lord to me, make for yourself a bar of yoke and put them on your neck and send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre, the king of Sidon, Right? by envoys who have come to King Tzidkiyahu of Yehuda, and he says, here's the Pasuk, um, and give them this charge to their masters. Thus said the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, say this to your masters. Anochi asiti et ha'aretz. It is I who made the earth, says Hashem, et ha'adam v'sabehema asher al pene ha'aretz, the kochi agadol bizrori hanatuya, right? Everything belongs to me, and here's the four words. And I give it to whomever I deem proper. Right? And now I'm going to tell you, he says, And now, you think you own this country now. I'm letting you know in a couple of years, Nebuchadnezzar, Melech Bavel is going to come. Right? And I am going to give everything to Nebuchadnezzar. All right, so here it is. Nebuchadnezzar ends up getting everything. Okay, and back to the Radak. Okay, the Radak says, just to end, the Radak says, he quotes this Pasuk, and of course he makes reference to the most famous Rashi in all of Chumash, which is the very first Rashi. Remember what Rashi says? He says, right, why do we have to start off, right, with the story of Bracious? Let's start from the mitzvos. So he says, we want to make sure that the nations of the world know, right, who really, who really owns Eretz Yisrael, that it was given to us, right? For should the people of the world say to Israel, you are robbers because you took by force the land of the seven nations of Canaan, Israel may reply to them, all the earth belongs to the Holy One, blessed be he, he created it and gave it to whom he pleased. He wielded, he gave it to them, and when he will, he took it from you, from them, and gave it unto us. So here's another perfect example of how things change, right? And if you look at it, we don't need to be experts and historians, but if you ever have seen the Roman Empire, right, how vast they owned, the Ottomans, the Byzantines, the Mongols, I mean, I actually looked at the map, at the map of how far the Mongol Empire was, it was like three quarters of the world. It was unbelievable, and at that point, with uh, with Genghis Khan and that, you right, someone were to tell you that this was all going to end, like you wouldn't believe it, right? Back then, but what do we see? We see that borders change every day, right? Just open up the paper, right? With Ukraine, Russia, borders change, kings change, things come and go. The only thing that's constant is us, and the fact that God, in one second, could determine it's not up to the people, right? Who gets what, right? Every week, every year, something else is happening ge geographically. Africa, right? Disputed territories, Sudan, Egypt. There's, you wouldn't believe that, you know, uh, that, that, that Sudan actually claims part of Egypt. No one really cares because it's Sudan. But anyway, there are, there are, there are places today in the world, like Pakistan and, 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 right, and India, that, that whole area over there, the Kashmir, right? There are disputed places that will always be disputed back and forth, and depending on who's in charge, will come and will go. But this is all up to, as the Radak said 970 years ago, that this all means nothing. That's why we're so into the details of what? Of, of, of Ashur, and was it, and who was going to where? And was Usher the person go right? Was was, um, was uh, Nimrod going out, or was Usher going out? All this, this is all to show that what that this is all temporary. That doesn't really matter, 
right? Because after all, it's God that decides who. It's a very interesting segue uh, on a little line the Gemara uses that we probably glanced over as to, you know, are things called in the, you know, in the future tense and, you know, in the names in the future. So I thought that was very interesting. 